Good evening. My name is Chase Robinson, and as president, I have the, uh, the great privilege of welcoming you to the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and to tonight's event. For those of us who are watching via live stream, wherever you are, thank you for coming. Now, before we begin tonight's program, I think you'll agree that we should acknowledge those whose lives were lost as a result of the horrific shooting in Los, and in Las Vegas last night. Events like that one, events that seem to become all too frequent and dare I say even common, assault our humanity. Such events, if you'll indulge me, a brief editorial intervention are not fully explained as acts of pure evil. Policy and legislation here, as in healthcare, matter. These events... <laughs> the events, I believe, are chastening reminders of the very high price that America insists on paying for this certain kind of exceptionalism. As our name implies, the Graduate Center is a national leader in graduate education, in the masters, but especially doctoral education. As many of you will know, we're the home of pioneering research and creative work of Nobel Guggenheim and Pulitzer winners, we're one of the largest PhD granting institutions in the country, and we are especially proud to rank among the country's top 10 institutions in awarding doctorates to students from underrepresented minority groups. The Graduate Center, however, is not just a place dedicated to advanced education and research. It's also a proving ground of ideas, which endeavors to deliver the very best research and scholarship to and indeed far beyond the city of New York. Each year, our doctoral stu students teach more than 200,000 undergraduates in the CUNY system. And when they do that, they bring the very best research and learning from the seminar room into every borough of the city. It is a fantastic project. The Graduate Center is also an incubator of vigorous debate, and that's something reflected in our academic programs, of course, but also in the scores of free public events across our 30 centers and institutes, such as the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, which is a co-sponsor of this evening's program. Now our discussion tonight is a sequel to the eight-part series we hosted last spring, which focused on the first 100 days of the Trump presidency. Like tonight's program, that series was designed to help navigate this unprecedented political era. <laughs> Tonight we turn our attention to healthcare policy, which I think you'll agree has become a political lightning rod, igniting vigorous debate in Washington, in the media, even at the dinner table. As an institution that values and transmits research and facts, we're honored to have some of the leading voices on this topic with us tonight, and they will be adding more light than heat to our conversation, I believe. Our moderator this evening is New York Times columnist Margot Sanger Katz, who covers health care for the upshot. She was previously a reporter at National Journal and the Concord Monitor, and an editor at Legal Affairs Magazine and the Yale Alumni Magazine. She's a popular voice on healthcare policy, specifically on Obamacare, and what its repeal or reform could mean for consumers and the nation as a whole. Tonight, Margo will host a panel of experts with divergent views, a discussion emblematic of what we do every day at the Graduate Center. Tonight's panelists are Jonathan Gruber, Ovik Roy, Dana Singheiser, and Paul Krugman. Jonathan Gruber, Ford Professor of Economics at MIT, 
is widely acknowledged as one of the foremost experts on healthcare policy. As a consultant to the Obama administration, he helped craft the legislation that we know as Obamacare. Prior to that, he advised on the design and implementation of Massachusetts's ambitious health reform effort known as Romney Care. Slate Magazine named him one of the top 25 most innovative and practical thinkers, thinkers of our time, and he was twice rated one of the most powerful people in healthcare in the United States by Modern Healthcare Magazine. Dana Singheiser, the Vice President for Public Policy and Government Affairs at the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, is a leading advocate for women's reproductive health care. Over the course of her distinguished career, she's worked for two presidents, two senators, and five presidential campaigns. Most recently, she served in the Obama administration as special assistant to the president for legislative affairs, and she was a key member of the team that helped pass health care reform. She also served in the Clinton administration and worked on the presidential campaigns of both President Clinton and Hillary Clinton. Ovik Roy is an avowed believer in the conservative case for universal coverage and has been called the go-to policy wonk critic of the health care law, the guru, according to Meet the Press. He is the co-founder and president of the think tank, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, and has been an opinion editor at Forbes magazine since 2014. He previously served as a policy advisor to presidential candidates Rick Perry and Marco Rubio. Finally, last but not least, our own Paul Krugman. Paul is a Nobel Prize winning economist, a prolific author, op-ed columnist, and blogger for the New York Times. His blog, The Conscience of a Liberal, was ranked number one of the 25 best financial blogs by Time Magazine, and he's written extensively this year about healthcare. He's a distinguished professor of economics here at the Graduate Center and a scholar in our Stone Center for Socioeconomic Inequality. Indeed, uh, an institute that in no small part is due to his numerous contributions it's become a recognized leader in the study of economic inequality. Please do join me in welcoming all of our distinguished guests. Here we go. Um, thank you all so much for coming. We are looking forward to having vigorous debate with more light than heat. Um, but I wanted to just say from the outset that we are hoping to have questions from all of you at the end of our discussion. And my understanding is that you have been given note cards on the way in. So as we talk, when you discover you have a burning question, please write it down. And I will let you know there'll be an opportunity to hand that card to an usher and uh, they will make their way to me and I'll be able to ask some of your questions of our guests. Um, so I wanted to just start with a sort of crazy week in healthcare policy. Uh, this is two weeks ago in Washington. Early in the week, there were hearings on Capitol Hill uh, where a bipartisan group of senators was trying to think about how they could make small alterations in Obamacare to try to fix some of the problems, make it work a little bit better. And then late in the week, there were two big pieces of legislation introduced. One was the Graham-Cassidy bill, which uh, had this dramatic arc and sort of uh, died recently, but that was an attempt by Republicans to repeal the Affordable Care Act and replace it with a set of block grants that would allow states to have a lot of flexibility about how to manage their health care programs, but um, less money than they might have had otherwise. And then on the same day, Bernie Sanders introduced his Medicare for All bill, which was I think a similarly sort of revolutionary plan to try to do away with the healthcare system the United States has now and to instead expand the Medicare program for senior citizens to cover all Americans and cover more benefits. And to me, um, it just felt like there was this whole wide range of thinking about where the future was. And also there was some agreement, I think, among all of the various players in that week 
that the healthcare system that we have right now, while it has many great qualities, is not doing all of the things that we want it to do, that there are still many Americans who lack health insurance, that the cost of health insurance is very high, and that the cost of medical care, even for people with insurance, can be very high, that there are great inequalities in people's access to health care and to their actual health and that there are lots of other uh, values and, and questions uh, that, that are still feel that they need to be wrestled with, even though we have had this historic transformation and expansion of health insurance coverage in Obamacare. So I'm hoping that we will be able to touch on all of the places along that waterfront. But I wanted to um, start by just asking everyone on the panel sort of, where are we right now? What do, you, what do you see as kind of the status of the healthcare system now and the sort of, uh, moment on the horizon that seems the most exciting to you. And why don't we just go down the line, starting with John. Is it on? Yeah. Now it's on. Um, thank you, Margo. It's, it's great to be here uh, and to be back in New York City. I grew up over in Ridgewood, New Jersey, so I uh, spent my youth in the old Times Square when it used to look very different than the current Times Square. Um, so uh, I realized that came out wrong. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was at the pinball arcade, okay? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, I'm happy to talk about healthcare. Look, uh, let's just start with stipulation that healthcare is unbelievably hard and complicated, and that attempts to simplify. This is, this is what keeps me employed, it, and maybe you guys too. It, do an incredible violence, but I'm going to try nonetheless by saying that you can essentially figure out the entire healthcare debate by keeping your mind on two facts: what I call the 2080 rule and the 80 satisfied rule. The 2080 rule is that 20% of Americans spend 80% of the healthcare dollars. What that means is by definition, Americans cannot by themselves finance their healthcare. There is no system where we plausibly ask 20% of Americans to pay 80% of the healthcare costs. It's just unbearable. So there has to be some form of risk sharing in society, it has to happen. And any time you hear people giving sort of what sound like magic solutions, like, gee, we can just do this instead, remember, if it doesn't obey the 2080 rule, it's not going to work. Either that means you have to have the sick bear an unconscionable part of their costs, at least in my opinion, but maybe not in others, or you have to have the government finance those costs, or you have to have the healthy come into the system and contribute to the sick, or you have to have employers come in, somebody has to cross-subsidize the sick, or you can just let the sick pay their bills or not pay their bills. So that's rule one. Rule two is the 80 satisfied rule, which is 80% of Americans are pretty satisfied with their health insurance arrangements. I'm not saying happy. I'm not saying wouldn't be interested in something better. I'm saying not very excited to give it up for an unknown plan. And that's the fundamental barrier that true fundamental reform faces like single payer, is it's hard to tell 80% of Americans we're gonna take away what you're kind of satisfied and used to and give you something new. It's very hard. So we've got this situation where single payer in some sense would be almost the easiest replace way to deal with the 2080 rule, but it runs into the 80 satisfied rule. And so that is in some sense the two benchmarks that have to circumscribe how we think about this debate. And we'll talk about tonight about where we go next, but as you hear those answers and think about it, I want you to come back to remembering somebody's got to bear the risk and people are kind of happy with what they have now. Obamacare was an attempt to try to obey those two rules. It was an attempt, I, I like to call it incremental universalism, which sounds a bit like a new religion, but it's basically saying it was incremental in building what worked and universal in getting universal coverage. It was an attempt to do it. It was an awkward, complicated attempt that had a lot of disadvantages, but that was sort of why it was structured the way it was, to try to be, fit within those two parameters. There may be other approaches that do, but let's remember those guideposts as we go forward. Dana? Uh, thanks so much for having me tonight, and thank you, President Robinson, for, for hosting us. Uh, you know, there is such an important dialogue going on about health care in this country, but what I find really remarkable is that what is missing is really the voices of those who are impacted, and I think that is particularly true for women across the country, that, uh, that really what they want and what they need and how they experience health care is really just not part of the conversation that we're having. And we saw that uh, play out over the past few months with all of these efforts to repeal and marginally replace Obamacare and every single time to defund Planned Parenthood. And what we saw was women across the country saying enough. 
no way. They were calling their congressmen, marching in the streets, signing petitions, and, and pushing back. And, um, and throughout that debate at Planned Parenthood, we kept hearing from our opponents, well, um, Planned Parenthood isn't necessary. That's why we can defund it. You know, it's not a problem. All those women can go someplace else. Well, I just want to say, first of all, <laughs> that is just patently false. Uh, experts across the country have have discounted that assertion. Uh, not just not just experts in the healthcare field, but leading uh, journalists and op-eds uh, have said that 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 there's just not enough uh, in our social safety net to absorb the patients who come who choose to come to Planned Parenthood. And that is because a lot of our healthcare centers are in medically underserved rural um, or, or uh, short, large shortage areas. So there really are no other healthcare providers um, uh, to take our patients. But I think more than that just being provably false, what is really remarkable about that, um, that statement is really it shows an incredible bias in our system, that somehow it's, it's okay to get rid of a whole swath of providers that, that largely women re rely on, and somehow that's okay. That's okay. Women don't deserve the choice to go to the provider uh, that they choose. Um, but we know what, the, what happens when, when that, when politicians insert their views on the healthcare system, because we saw this in the state of Texas. When Governor Perry was on a crusade to shut down literally dozens of our health centers. And what we saw was just an, an enormous impact on the health of the women of the state of Texas. We saw a dramatic rise in STDs, we saw a dramatic rise in unintended pregnancies, and we saw the maternal mortality rate in the state of Texas double in four years, double. That means that literally women were dying because they did not have access to basic health care that was taken away from them uh, because of the politicians. So it's undeniable that there isn't enough of a backup to, um, uh, to absorb Planned Parenthood's patients. But, but the other thing we sort of got a sense of through this debate was that there was something else going on between our patients and our providers, something around potentially, I don't know, trust between uh, our patients and their OBGYNs. So we did something uh, that shouldn't be remarkable, but it, but it turns out nobody else was doing this. And we actually asked women what they wanted from their health care providers. We asked them what they wanted um, um, from their health care experience. And the most remarkable finding we found was that women have a greater trust in their OBGYNs than in general practitioners. And because of that greater trust, they are more likely to be open and honest with, with their OBGYN than they are with their general practitioner. And in fact, by a 25 point margin, they are more likely to tell uh, their OBGYN about their, their health care needs. Uh, so I can only imagine those on the panel here what you might suspect that that would mean in terms of the outcome for those women um, in their health care. Um, but the other thing that we're doing at Planned Parenthood really is looking ahead and looking at how women experience health care, how they want to experience health care, and how we can make it more accessible. And the truth is there is so much exciting technology and, um, and exciting medical advances that, that we are taking advantage of and the whole system really is, is starting to take advantage of. Um, such as the fact uh, uh, we are offering online appointment scheduling. So two and a half million people have actually booked their appointments online. Simply with the click of their, uh, of their phone, they can make an appointment for a breast cancer screening or an STD test or to get their birth control. Um, we're also uh, developing uh, telemedicine and um, have pilot programs throughout the country. And that what that has enabled us to do is literally deliver birth control pills by float planes, uh, by a float plane to a, a patient we had in the Arctic Circle. Literally dropped her health care, her birth control pills uh, after having a consultation with a provider in a different city. And finally, we use chat text to talk to over 20,000 young people every single month using their phones about virtually every healthcare um, and reproductive health question you, you could possibly imagine. So when we think about the future of healthcare, we're really excited about meeting women where they are, uh, listening to what they want, and helping them have better health outcomes. Thanks to uh, Paul and to, to Chase and to CUNY for, for having us all here today. It's, uh, 
It's a special pleasure for me. This is my first time speaking at a CUNY event. I've long admired the mission of this institution as Chase alluded to earlier. CUNY is one of the leading institutions in the country in taking lower income individuals and getting them into high skilled, high paying jobs after college. Um, and the, the, the foundation, uh, the think tank that I, uh, that I am president of and co-founded uh, last year is devoted to very similar issues. It's called the Foundation for Research on uh, equal opportunity and we focus, our mission is entirely to come up with ideas for national ideas for policy reform that can move the needle for, for uh, people who most need economic opportunity. 100% of our work focuses on moving the needle for people with below median incomes or net worth. And we launched last September actually with a 102 page white paper on market oriented universal coverage. And, and as Chase alluded to, that's been something where I've been uh, perhaps a, a contrarian voice in uh, conservative Republican circles and arguing that, that really, why, so why have Republicans struggled to articulate a message on, on healthcare and conservatives? I would argue it's because the fact that there are Americans who go bankrupt because of medical bills is a serious problem that we have to solve as a country. You can solve it through with a single payer system. You can solve it in more market oriented systems with a more market oriented approach. I personally believe that, that competition, innovation, private sector, consumer choice can achieve those, those outcomes. And until Republicans and conservatives embrace that, as an outcome, they're never going to really be able to achieve real reform because that is not just a need for people who are uninsured, it's a need for the people who are insured but for whom an increasing part of their paycheck is being eaten up by the high cost of medical care. And here's the other thing. You all know that we have the most expensive health care system in the world. 18% of our GDP is spent on health care compared to 9 to 11% in your typical European country. What you might not know is that Public expenditure on health care in the United States, government expenditure on health care in the United States per capita is the third highest in the world and was before Obamacare became law. And so a big part of my conservative case for universal coverage is to say, hey, if we actually make health care and health insurance more affordable and we stop subsidize, over-subsidizing health coverage for the wealthy, which we do in this country, we can actually cover more people, cover everybody, and spend less money both overall and in terms of government spending than we spend today. So you can achieve, our healthcare system is so messed up that you can achieve progressive goals and conservative goals at the same time with the right set of reforms. And maybe that's pie in the sky to hope that we can achieve those kinds of reforms, but the only way you get there is to start advocating for them and doing the quantitative research to show that they're possible. So that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, that's what I think you're seeing an increasing number of people who are right of center starting to do. And my hope is that whatever the denouement of this recent episode is, that's where we're gonna be in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna do something I never do, which is disagree with John Gruber for about five seconds. Um, I don't think healthcare is actually all that complicated. I mean, obviously in the details, it's enormously complicated, but compared with you know, corporate taxation, which is a real uh, triple excedrin issue. Uh, healthcare is, is relatively simple um, in, in terms of, certainly in terms of paying for it. And there, suppose that you want to cover everybody or almost everybody. There are two basic ways of doing that. One is simply the government covers people, single payer, um, which is, turns out to be extremely hard to get to from here. It's the old Vermont farmer. If he wanted to go there, I wouldn't start from here, uh, given, given the US system and given the fact that most people are satisfied. The other is some, basically some combination of regulation, subsidies, uh, mandates to sort of chivy a, a private sector decentralized system into uh, into achieving what single payer would have achieved. Uh, both systems exist in many versions around the world. Both systems work. Uh, basically every advanced country except us has near universal coverage. Um, now what we did with the Affordable Care Act was, if you like, a kind of a half-assed version of both. Expansion of Medicaid, which turned out to be a very big factor, and the creation of a system of subsidies, regulations, and so on. Uh, all of it somewhat underfunded, somewhat weak, uh, not what you would have done if you had unlimited political capital. Um, uh, nonetheless, I think it is important, after all the political storm and drang, to realize that despite the inadequacies, a lot has been achieved. And especially you want to bear in mind that 
given the way we set this up, we don't have one healthcare system, we have 50 healthcare systems. And in the states that tried to make it work, that expanded Medicaid, that ran their own exchanges and ran them well, uh, a tremendous amount of progress was made. So I, I like to look at California, which had 18% uninsured in 2010, has 7% uninsured now. Now that's not universal coverage, but it's a long change. And if you want to say, oh, but it's lousy coverage, you should talk to some of the people whose, whose lives have been transformed and saved by this system. So we made enormous progress. If you, if you ask, you know, where did I think US healthcare was going to be 10 years ago? It's incredibly better than it was, but the system is underfunded, underworked. US healthcare costs are way high compared with anyone else's, and that's an interesting question. Exactly what is the cause of that? We, why we why can't we do that. better? <laughs> um, but it's, um, but I am actually, uh, you know, if I, if I can step back from what have been a, a very nerve wracking, you know, it's been a very nerve wracking, I, I guess I would say at, at this point, a very nerve wracking eight months. Uh, um, the, what, what we've actually discovered is, first of all, look, uh, we've made a lot of progress, and that progress is looking a lot more durable politically. It turns out that it, at some level we've won the argument that, that, uh, that basic health care is something everyone should be able to have in this country, and I think, I think we're going we're gonna to preserve it, and maybe even, uh, since I'm in this weirdly optimistic mood tonight, maybe even we'll get some bipartisan cooperation on starting to make the system work better, starting with, you know, renewing CHIP, because uh, nine million uh, children just lost funding for their health insurance, I think more in a fit of absence of mind than anything else. But I, I, I actually think that we've, we've gone through a, a, a debate that may end up eventually paving the way for taking what is substantial but incomplete progress and bringing it the rest of the way. So I am very aware of John's point that 80% of Americans are largely satisfied with their arrangements. And yet, when you poll the public about would they like a major change in the healthcare system, the majority tend to say yes to that question too. So uh, I think one example of this is with the Republican call to repeal and replace Obamacare. You know, they've been uh, campaigning on that message for seven years. They've been arguing that in both in campaigns and in Congress, presidential candidates. And you have seen, you know, since even before Obamacare passed, that there was a majority of Americans that agreed with that premise, and certainly a majority of Republicans who agreed with that premise. Um, and yet, when Republicans came to power and uh, you know had the presidency in both houses of Congress, they really faltered as they tried to implement that vision. And we see similar polling on single payer now, where there have been several surveys that have come out that have shown sort of a small majority of Americans like the idea of single payer, but and larger majorities of Democrats like the idea of single payer. And that is despite, as John says, that a lot of people really like the particular arrangement that they have for themselves. And I think it's awfully hard for politicians to sort of operate between those two messages. One message, change everything. The other message, please don't change my thing. And so I, I was hoping, you know, we've just been through this, this long uh, episode of, of trying to repeal and replace Obamacare, and I wonder, what have we learned from that? You know, why was it so hard? And are there lessons in that for thinking about the Democratic Party becoming more ambitious around the idea of single payer? And Ovik, I know that you uh, had some involvement in the efforts, not every bill, but some of them in talking with people on the Hill. And so I, I'd like everyone to talk about this, but I was hoping perhaps you could talk first about where you think Republicans went wrong or what, what were the particular challenges of this effort and why is it that after all of these years of campaigning on this issue and so much apparent public support for it, they just weren't able to get it across the finish line despite all of these attempts. Well, it's first important to, to recognize that they did, it's not like they only got 10 votes for their plan. They got 49 votes for their plan. Um, and the composition of the Senate can change. Well, they not, didn't really get 49 elections. votes well, for any particular plan. There, there right? wasn't a vote, to be, to be very clear, but, but they, were, they were very close. Um, and so there are lots, of, it's kind of like when, you know, the Patriots beat the Falcons in the Super Bowl, and you can say, okay, why did the Patriots win? Did they win because Tom Brady is a great quarterback, or did they win because the defense was good, or because Atlanta screwed up? You know, there are lots of things you can point to as to the reason why they fell a handful of votes short. 
Um, the proximate was, of course, John McCain, but there were other, each senator had their own priorities, their own things that they either liked or didn't like about the bill, the ones who said no. Um, so we could get into that, but you know, I, I don't think that's really the question you were asking but, in a but sense. But all of those people did campaign on a message that they wanted to repeal and sure. replace Obamacare. Well, so it's not that they didn't want to do it, they just didn't, couldn't find a thing that they could all agree on. Right? Well, and I, th I think this gets to the broader point I was going to make, which is that uh, Republicans were united around a slogan, repeal and replace Obamacare. But there was not a lot of, of unity around what that really meant. What is the problem in the healthcare system we're trying to solve? And I think part of the challenge was that you had pre-ACA, pre-Obamacare, you had large constituencies, as, as John was mentioning, that were really happy. The people on Medicare are really happy, even though Medicare has tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded liabilities, the people who are on it are happy. The people who are on the employer-based system, which costs us you know, 400 to 500 billion dollars a year in lost tax revenue, depending on how you count it, the people who are being heavily subsidized by that system love that system. Well, so we spend $1.2 trillion, give or take, subsidizing health insurance for old people and employed people. Well, that's a lot of Republican voters. Uh, and so that's been the challenge for Republicans, is they, they know what they're against, but they're not as united on what they're for. And I think the process of, you know, Democrats have been trying to do this for a long time, right? So there was the Hillary care crash and burn that led to 15 years of reflection, that led to, like, hey, let's borrow from Omnicare and figure this out. Republicans, it's almost actually miraculous that Republicans got as close as they've gotten to change given that disunity of purpose. So in my mind, the way that Republicans, the only way they're going to succeed in the future is if they have a unity of purpose around what they want the system to look like. What, what are they trying to accomplish? And to me, simply saying you want to repeal Obamacare but leave the rest of the system in place, which is kind of the instinct of a lot of Republicans, is not the right answer. The right answer is not only do we have to make the healthcare system more affordable for the people who are uninsured and struggling to pay their healthcare bills, we have to remember that nearly all of the growth in federal spending as a share of our economy is healthcare spending. It's Medicare, it's Medicaid, it's the other big federal healthcare programs. And if we don't get that federal spending under control, we're gonna have a Greece-like situation with no bigger country to bail us out. So we have to solve that problem somehow. And if we don't solve it through careful, organic, gradual reforms, the result will be draconian cuts that will hurt the most vulnerable the most. So we have to figure this out. And by the way, the only other thing that's growing as a share of federal spending, I should correct myself, uh, as a share of GDP is interest on the debt. In 10 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office, we're gonna be spending more on interest on the federal debt than we do on our entire military budget. That's how serious the problem is. And the only way we can solve those problems is through having a healthcare system where we where we provide subsidies and financial assistance for the sick, for the vulnerable, for the poor, the people who need the help, but not for upper income people, which is what we do today and what Republicans struggle with uh, changing. Other theories about what went wrong? Yeah, this is just so exciting to get disagree with Paul. I, um, I, healthcare is hard, and this is exactly proof of why it's hard, because you can make it sound easy, but it's not. And repeal and replace sounded easy. Uh, and in fact, it was doing well. It wasn't about 49 votes. It was about the Congressional Budget Office. And I think this is the most fundamental victory for fact-based policymaking of a, in a long time. That basically this thing was doing fine till the CBO reminded Americans of the 2080 rule and said, look, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Okay, if you want to have a system which provides for the sick, someone else has to pay. And that is the fundamental challenge Republicans were not up to. They were not up to the challenge that someone else has to pay. They wanted to cut the financing of the Affordable Care Act, but not replace it with anything. They wanted to get rid of the individual mandate, which maintains a common risk pool that allows insurers to price fairly, but not replace it with anything. At the end of the day, what Obamacare did was say, we're gonna to try to deal with the 2080 rule by bringing a bunch of things together. Okay, by bringing in the government, by bringing in employers to a small extent with a small employer mandate, by bringing in healthy individuals with an individual mandate. And let's be clear, the Affordable Care Act created losers, okay? I would argue, basically, roughly speaking, the Affordable Care Act roughly left 80% of Americans alone, made about 17% of Americans winners, and sort of made about 3% of Americans losers. And who were they? They were very rich people who had to pay higher taxes, and they were healthy people who benefited from the previously discriminatory individual market, okay? Basically, if you got to sit at the front of the bus before, now you have to share the bus, you're a little less happy. 
okay? That doesn't mean we should let people stay in the front of the bus. That means we should share the bus. But that meant that people who were young and healthy in California before the ACA, you could get insurance for 100 bucks a month. You can't do that anymore. The reason they could do that in California is because if you were sick, you just couldn't get it. Now we say everyone has to get it, and if you're young and healthy, you've got to pay $250 a month. Now that's a big increase for them. That's a 250% in increase, okay? And I absolutely am sympathetic to that. But at the end of the day, you cannot make a reform that's as fundamental as this without creating a small subset of losers. You can't create pure winners, unless you want to violate Ovik's last point and blow up the deficit. And here the contrast is very interesting. Because what is the Republicans' greatest success in health care policy? Medicare Part D. Under George Bush, he recognized the fact that Medicare was a flaw to not cover prescription drugs. They wanted to cover prescription drugs, and they did so in a way that created no losers. How did they do that? By making our grandchildren the losers. Okay, by adding to the deficit. Okay, and honestly, to be honest, I am super surprised that's not the route the Republicans took. At one level, I'm almost impressed. They, they would have been very easy to simply say, we're going to replace the individual mandate by throwing hundreds of billions of dollars of insurers. You get to the same point. It's all about financing the 2080 rule. You can get rid of the individual mandate by giving a bunch of money to insurers. And at some level, it would have been sort of easy to replicate Obamacare and repeal Obamacare, and they didn't. Uh, but at the end of the day, there is the fundamental bottom line, and this is just where Ovik and I disagree. There is nothing to the right of Obamacare which does not cover many fewer people or cost much more money, nothing. Obamacare is the single most conservative way to cover as many people in America as you could, okay? And that is, that's the fundamental reason that no repeal bill could pass because it just wasn't something to do. There, in some sense, Romney stole and Obama then stole the Republicans' best idea and there was nothing left. So I see that Ovik is eager to jump in and Paul's eager to jump in. I'm just gonna interrupt for one moment and just say that uh, the time has come for you to share your cards with the ushers. So uh, we are gonna keep talking, but uh, if you have last minute thoughts to write down, write them down and uh, someone will collect them so that we can uh, ask them later. Um, first of all, I just wanna bring up a fact, which is that one of the surprises, and this is all kind of in the background when we focus on Obamacare, is that for some reason, the rate of increase of healthcare costs in general has flattened out dramatically that one of the things that has happened since the ACA was passed was that, um, you know, just general, me Medicare costs have grown much more slowly than anticipated. Um, private, uh, you know, employer-based premiums have grown more slowly than anticipated. Uh, the, if you look, long-run U.S. budget outlook estimates are much better than they appeared to be in 2010, essentially because of healthcare costs. Now, we don't, there were a bunch of cost-saving measures in the ACA, we have no idea how important they were, but it, 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 the odd thing is if you look at, at that issue, if your concern is the general cost of health care, uh, if your concern is the cost of government health care programs outside the ACA, that's been all good news. It's all been stunningly good news, and, and you know, we, we don't know how we did that, but, it's, uh, um, but that's, that's a positive. Um, what I would say is, is that, and this is going back to Margo, um, change is hard. Anything, anytime you take a system and you say, we're gonna change it around and we're going to replace what you have with something different, um, I, no matter how persuasive you are, trying to convince people that that something different is going to be better when what they have is okay, uh, is, you know, is, is not, is, is hard to do. It's, um, one last point, I think it's, it is interesting, and this by, by John's point, um, I've been surprised, actually, that raw um, fiscal irresponsibility has not been more prevalent uh, in the last, you know, in the last eight months. Uh, I would have, um, you know, I, I'm <laughs> transitioning tentatively, keeping one toe ready for, for more healthcare stuff, but I'm transitioning now to, you know, tax policy, and I am actually shocked that concerns about just how much we're going to blow up the deficit seem actually to be mattering. I took, it, I took it for granted that, that all of those deficit concerns were completely hypocritical. And it turns out, no, they're only about 90% hypocritical. And, uh, and, and so these things are real. And, and apparently a healthcare reform that, that simply was completely unfunded uh, was not on the table, even for this administration, even for this Congress. So I'm hoping, Dana, that I can put you on the spot to talk a little bit about single payer, because I was really struck 
not by the fact that Bernie Sanders introduced a single-payer bill, which he's done many times before, but that uh, we saw 16 co-sponsors on that bill, including many of the people we expect to be running for president in the Democratic Party. And it, in the House, there's a single-payer bill that has the majority of Democrats in the House are now uh, co-sponsors of that bill. So it seems like this is an idea that has very much entered the mainstream of our political conversation. It's likely to be uh, front and center in the 2020 presidential election and maybe even in uh, next year's congressional elections. How do, how do you think about this? Do you, and, and do you think that some of these lessons apply or don't apply? Yeah, well, it's, it was refreshing to see uh, a health care bill and a health care proposal that actually covered women's health care um, and actually acknowledged that it is important for a health care system, a robust health care system, to cover comprehensive reproductive health care, and that includes abortion. So we uh, are grateful to Senator Sanders for really uh, centering his proposal around um, around what what people need, and, and particularly uh, a sector of the of the population that I think has largely been shut out of, of considerations around health care. And, and it really stands in contrast to uh, what happened over the course of the past six or eight months, which, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to what you said, Jonathan, about the 80-20 the rule. Well, the 80% of the people who like their health care, well, it would have been good if anybody had asked them what they thought this year. And you know, a, a week ago this afternoon, I was in the Dirksen Senate office building sort of lurking outside of the one sham of a hearing that uh, the Republican leadership held uh, to sort of justify this complete overhaul of one-sixth of our economy. And what I saw were literally hundreds of people who would be impacted by this bill, uh, disability rights act activists, women, children, families, just trying to get in the room to be heard. Now, many of them were arrested and, and hauled away instead. But to me, you know, the-, the well, they, they were protesting and trying to interfere with the hearings. They weren't just arrested arbitrarily. They're, they're, the, the contrast of one sham of a hearing with what we went through in 2009 and 2010, where we literally had, uh, I think, almost 80 congressional hearings, 21 days of markups, 25 days on the Senate floor. I mean, I can't tell you how many dinners and holidays I missed with my family. And But it was important to actually listen to what people wanted and listen to what they needed. And, and to me, the contrast of, of that process and what we went through really to understand um, uh, really, it, it just, the, the difference could not be any more stark to what happened this past year. So, you know, to me, the, you know, why this failed is really quite simple. They, there was actually no effort, even a, 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 a pretend effort, to listen to the people that would be impacted. So, you know, I'm excited about uh, efforts to actually expand health care and, um, and that respond to what people say. And, and again, I applaud Senator Sanders for putting out a bold vision on that front. So I promised that we would come back to this, and I want to make sure that we do. So I think one of the primary challenges that we face on this issue is that the United States has the most expensive healthcare system in the world. Um, it's not even close. And while we have experienced in these last few years, as Paul said, a sort of moderation and the increase of growth, historically, we've had a very expensive system that gets more and more expensive each year, and the growth in the cost of our healthcare system tends to grow more quickly than the growth in our overall economy, the growth in inflation, and the growth in people's wages. And so what that means is that healthcare is just kind of this hungry monster that's eating up other resources and other priorities. And it strikes me that this is the problem that underlines a lot of the political debate, because you know we've been talking as a country a lot about how to get people covered, how to get people health insurance, but the healthcare system is so expensive, which is why premiums are so expensive, which is why people have so much financial exposure. And um, if we could step back a little bit from the media political debate, can you can you guys each explain a little bit about like why are things so expensive here and, and what could be done about that? Well, let me set the context uh, um, a little bit, which is with two facts. Okay, fact one is from 1950 till today, the amount of spending on healthcare in the US has quadrupled, and it's been worth it. Okay, healthcare sucked in 1950. Okay, <laughs> babies were four times as likely to die before they reached their first birthday. Heart attack victims were four times as likely to die within one year. If you hurt your knee skiing, you were in the hospital for a week, you were on crutches for three weeks, and you had arthritis the rest of your life. Now you hurt your knee skiing, you're out in the slopes the next weekend. Okay, by standard economist calculations of the value of the improved health, it's been worth it. 
Fact two is we waste a huge amount of what we spend on healthcare. By some estimates, about a third. Now the question is how can you reconcile these two facts? Well, the trick is the other two thirds has been awesome. So basically we've had a system where there's been an enormous amount of improvement dragging along a lot of baggage. But there's been an enormous amount of improvement in many other countries that don't have a system as expensive as ours. Absolutely. But if you look at a lot of the innovation in healthcare, look at the end of the year, one million people every year come to America to get treated for health care. No one goes anywhere else. They might go to get drugs in another country, but no one's flying to France for surgery. Okay? At the end of the day, we do have the best healthcare system in America as long as you're in the system. As long as you're not, as long as you're in the system, one of the lucky 80%, we do. So the question is then, but we also have a uniquely inefficient system. Those two things are not in contrast. We have the best system, but it's only a little bit better and it's about 50% more expensive. And why is that? Well, there's two reasons. One, which I believe is the minority, is the wasted healthcare, the fact that we overtreat patients. By far the more important reason is simply unit prices. We just pay too much for stuff, okay? And that is really, by and large, the difference. Um, there was a great article in the Upshot, I don't know if you wrote this, about Singapore today, uh, uh, about, uh, did you write that one? I, no, I can't take credit for that one. Uh, about the fact everyone's like, oh, Singapore's got this market-based health care, it's only 4% of GDP, isn't that wonderful? Well, they regulate all the prices. So in some sense, what's market-based and what not is in the eye of the beholder, once again, another complication. But they regulate all the prices in Singapore. And I'm not saying there are other features they're just to emulate. But at the end of the day, we are stuck in this place where many of you remember in America, we used to have regulated prices. In the 1970s, in every state, including New York, hospital prices were regulated. We went away from that towards a more managed competition model. That hasn't worked. I'm not yet ready to say we need to go back to regulation, because that's got flaws too. But that's where we're stuck. It's a simple question, as one famous article in Health Affairs said, it's the price is stupid. And that's basically what's going on. You know, Margo, in this the debate that John and Paul are having about whether healthcare is complicated or not, I'm on Paul's side, actually. The basic, the basic answer to the question is simple. That is, why is healthcare so expensive in America? It's because we oversubsidize it for the wrong people. We started out in, the, in World War II with this, basically we created wage controls such that because uh, the Roosevelt administration was worried that with all the young men at war, there was gonna be this labor shortage and that was gonna lead to massive inflation. So they were gonna cap, they were gonna regulate what a barber could make, what a mechanic would make. And there was literally a list of what each of these professions or trades could make but health insurance wasn't part of that, uh, that law. And so employers started to realize that, well, we could actually get around these wage controls by offering people health insurance and thereby compete for workers. And what happened in, after that? Well, Eisenhower, in the Eisenhower administration, they codified that this tax code made it, uh, the IRS ruled that it was not gonna count as compensation that you could be taxed for the way you're taxed. You know, you're, you pay income taxes here in New York, you pay state and city taxes along with federal, and of course you pay your FICA taxes for your now, for your Medicare and Social Security. None of those taxes would apply to the value of health insurance that your employer provided with you. So what happens? For every dollar you get in salary, an employer figured out quickly, you can get $2 in health insurance for the same dollar, because you pay a dollar in, in, in wages, half of that goes to the government or one form of government or the other. If you get a dollar in health insurance, all of that goes to you. So what happens? Insurance gradually covered more and more things. Hospitals and doctors and drug companies realized they could charge higher and higher prices because nobody cared. It was like the open bar at your in-law's wedding, right? Like, if I'm at a cash bar later tonight, I'm probably going to get the Bud Light. But if I'm at an open bar at my in-law's wedding, I'm going for the single malt scotch. And our healthcare system economically is like that open bar. We all demand the best care and don't care what it costs because we think somebody else is paying the bill. Well, guess what? We're all paying the bill. Right, and that is a problem started with World War II. And then when Medicare was passed in 1965, Medicare was built on top of the employer-based system. The model of the insurance package that Medicare would, uh, would use was based on the commonly used employer-based health insurance at that time. And so we had this system where we did two things. We created a massive uh, entitlement through the tax code for the upper middle class in particular. They're the ones who benefit the most from it. Again, $400 billion a year in lost revenue to the Treasury. And then uh, Medicare, which is a universal entitlement, also benefits a lot of rich people, right? So we all pay taxes in this room so that Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett and even Paul Krugman can get government-subsidized health care. And Paul, I love you, but you don't need government-subsidized health care, right? You can afford it. Um, and, so, and so this is the fundamental problem is why is health care so expensive in America? It's because 
we're all paying taxes so rich people can get health insurance in America. And if we only focus on a safety net, if we had either a single payer system, or we said, you know what, we're going to regulate the prices, we're going to regulate access, we're going to make sure you can't get those expensive uh, uh, things that we don't like or we think are too costly, but everyone's going to get the same unit of coverage like Canada does, we could do that. And that would be fiscally more responsible the system we have. We could also have a market-based system where, you know what, we're going to say upper middle class and wealthy people, you're going to buy your own health coverage, we're not going to subsidize it for you, but for the safety net, for the poor, the sick, the vulnerable, we're going to help you out. That can also spend a lot less than we spend and also control inflation. We do neither of those things. We massively subsidize coverage and care for upper middle class and wealthy people, and we don't do enough for those in the working class who are struggling today, and that's why we have the messed up health care system we have. Okay. Um, I, I, I have a, both a, I actually disagree quite strongly with that for, for two reasons. One is the number of people who can actually afford to pay for their own health care without having some kind of government backstop care is quite small. Yeah, I could. Uh, Warren Buffett could. There are not a lot of people. We're talking about maybe two, three percent of the population. The amount of money that we spend, if, you know, take away Medicare from people who really don't need Medicare, you're going to save almost nothing. There, there, there are very, very few people. And that's because of, it's not just the 80-20. It's even, it's even a, if I remember correctly, it's something like 5 percent of healthcare patients uh, account for about half of healthcare expenditure. And the thing is, people do not know in advance if they're going to be in that 5 percent. You cannot say, let's find those 5% and we'll take care of, of them, because we don't know. And everyone could be one of those 5%. And I've, I've met a few people who, who are completely self-insured. They don't feel they need any of this. Not, not, each of them is worth at least $20 million, right? Real, real people, even if, you, even if you have $5 million in assets, if you get seriously sick, it can burn right through. And if you say, well, we're going to only have insurance for people you know, who, who are below, people are going to buy their... The private insurance markets, individual markets work terribly unless they're heavily, heavily regulated, combined with mandates, subsidies, in other words, unless they look like Obamacare. Um, the thing I, I, that, uh, oh, and uh, sorry, and the, the fact, the other fact that's worth pointing out is that you know, all these systems that are much cheaper than ours, uh, none of them are actually market-based systems. The, this, this remedy that says that we're gonna have the market and competition and skin in the game, that's how we're gonna get cheap medical care, Strange to say nobody does that. What you have is systems that are, have more government involvement, have more government payments that are nonetheless much cheaper than ours. Um, it's, now, here's where, uh, what, actually health insurance is, is not complicated. Health provision is, and the question, if you want to ask why U.S. healthcare is so expensive, you want to talk about providers and the incentives of providers and, and all of the ways in which our system basically rewards doctors for having an, a, a personal clinic to which they send patients for tests that probably don't actually enhance their survival chances and all of these things where our system is rife with, with bad incentives which have very little to do with the fact that taxpayers subsidize. and um, and. Uh, they want, and when we do have public stuff, you know, we, we can't say no. We, uh, at least things like Medicare, we don't say no. In some ways, Medicaid is more like what a lot of country systems are like. It, it, Medicaid has, has a formulary of drugs it will pay for, which means it can threaten not to put you on the formulary, which means it has bargaining power. So there, there's a bunch of different things. I don't know how we get there. I think part of the problem is because we have a system that has been accustomed to not saying no to anything and a system that has had very little regulation of their providers, um, you have a lot of opposition trying to change it. So I don't think we're going to get down to French healthcare costs uh, in my lifetime. Uh, but we can, we can do a lot, and we have done a surprising amount to actually at least restrain the growth of costs, which is enough you know, to, to at least get ourselves a sustainable system. Well. One area um, of healthcare that actually saves money and is an economic driver is family planning. And we know that for every dollar in federal funds spent on family planning, that saves the federal government seven dollars. For a family, for a will woman, you, will you to just quickly explain why? Why is that? Uh, uh, be, when women are able to control the timing and spacing of their families, they are more likely to finish school, to have uh, the careers of their choice, and to be economic drivers in their families and and in the country, and less likely to be uh, reliant on Medicaid and and other other services. 
Uh, so that is both, uh, I think, an economic driver for the country. It is an economic driver for families. But I think even more than that, I mean, we, we, we're talking a lot about the economics and the deficit and, uh, and, and really the cost of health care. But for a, a woman to be able to decide when or if to have children, that is just an, an extraordinary uh, 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 principle of equity and equality for, for women in this country. So, so I'm thrilled that it happens to also be an economic driver, but, but really I'm more interested in family planning being something that really empowers women to, to lead the lives that they want to lead. I'll just say one word. Um, stepping beyond health care proper, but it has a big impact, generally spending more on children, uh, food stamps, uh, early childhood health care, those are all things that aside from being, you know, justice, uh, make, are, save a lot of money in the long run. And it's insane that those things should be on the chopping block now. So I want to uh, come to some of your questions. Um, excuse my bad reading. Uh, so I have a, we have a question. If the American people want single payer, what are the one or two most important features of a successful transition path? And I think this actually sort of echoes some of what Paul was saying about, you know, it's hard to get from here to there. Yeah, so if you basically aggregate all the medical spending that the federal government would have to take on under the Bernie plan, it would increase federal spending by, I believe, $28 trillion over 10 years, which would increase the total budget of the federal government by 55%. So that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money. And so basically, you can only get there if you are willing to say, you know what, uh, those expensive procedures, we're, gonna, we're not going to allow you to do that on the single-payer system. Or uh, we're going to cut the cost that you pay hospitals and physicians and drug companies. And look, maybe we should be doing those things. All I'm saying is that that's not in the Bernie plan. The Bernie plan is all carrot and no stick. It's all we're going to cover everybody, we're, it's free health care for everybody, but we're not going to do the things that every other country does in single-payer, every other single-payer country does to regulate price and access to make that system fiscally work. So basically, I think if you think about single payer, you have to think of getting over three hurdles. One is my 80 satisfied rule. Two is the fact that we have an $800 billion a year private health insurance industry that's not going quietly into the night. But third, and this is where the economics get interesting, it comes a bit to Ovik's point. American healthcare today is financed by an enormous hidden tax, which is the fact that all of our employers pay us lower wages to make up for the fact they're giving health insurance. If you switch to single payer, you replace that hidden tax with an explicit tax. So I worked in the state of Vermont to help them model single payer. It would have lowered healthcare spending in the state and doubled their entire tax burden. You might say, how are those two things possible? It's because it would have massively reduced what employers spent. So I think if we're gonna get to single payer, the magic that's gonna get there is gonna be if someone could somehow convince the American public it's a fair trade. If somehow could someone say, look, you're actually not losing. You're replacing a hidden tax with an explicit tax. They'll be a better economist than I, certainly a better communicator than I. But if someone can explain that trade, then at least that hurdle can be the one that's, that, that you get over of the three hurdles you have to overcome. Buy-in is one way. Public option, something like that. With something like that is buried inside the Bernie plan, by the way. In some ways, some people have, have been telling me that forget what it says about the end goal. What it actually, it contains a provision that would allow people to start to buy into Medicare, and that's what would really matter. And, and there's a pretty good bet that if you did let people buy into a, a government-run system over time, they would more and more people would just gravitate to that, if only because it would be simpler. Uh, and you know, the, the, the easy thing would be to check that box on your form, um, which is, of course, that doesn't get over the hurdle of the insurance companies, which is why we don't have, well, that's why there was no public option in Obamacare, and all right, so it is. You know, the question we almost never ask in our, these healthcare debates is, why is it that for every other sector of the economy, things become cheaper and easier to use over time. We have Uber, we have the internet, we have smartphones. Why can't we do that in healthcare? And the reason we can't do that in healthcare is because the government at every level has done so much to mess up how the healthcare system could work. You basically have two intellectually or economically coherent ways you can go. You can go the single payer route. Or you can go the market-based route. Now, Paul says there's no such thing as a market in healthcare, and there are other economists uh, on the left who, who make that argument. I don't think that's true. I think, actually, there are ways to have a system that covers the poor, covers the sick, through taxes and spending, but while also allowing enough room for the innovation that could make the healthcare system more patient-centered than it is today. And unfortunately, the debate we're having in Washington and even here in this room, to a degree, uh, leaves that possibility aside. I totally agree. It's called Obamacare. 
I wish other people did. <laughs> uh, so we have a question. Progressives in the United States love to say that health care is a right, but what is the basis of that claim? You know, actually, I actually, I gave a talk at the Yale Political Union about this a few years ago, about how health care, the, the issue about, the way we talk about health care as a right uh, is, you know, there, there are actually different ways to think about rights. There's, there's the traditional sort of classical liberal way to think of rights. So the Bill of Rights, for example, is all about the things that Congress cannot do to infringe on your rights. Congress shall pass no law abridging freedom of speech, for example. Those are called negative rights. And there's what progressives call positive rights, which is the idea that the government has an affirmative duty to provide you with X, health care, education, et cetera. And I think what we often neglect in this discussion of healthcare being a right is, like someone like me, I support universal coverage. I think in, in the wealthiest country in the world, we should make sure that no American goes bankrupt due to medical bills. But the rights that we're neglecting are the rights to say, you know what? You have the right to go to the doctor of your choice. You have the right to choose the kind of insurance that really reflects the needs of your family. You have the right to have different kinds of health care arrangements that economists and policymakers haven't even thought of yet because the entrepreneur of 2027 is thinking them up right now. These are the rights that are being neglected when we say there are only certain kinds of health care and health coverage formats that we're going to allow out of state capitals or federal capitals. I, I was, just to say, I, I think we always have in no, some notion of what um, what, given, given the wealth of our society, we think every citizen ought to have. And that doesn't mean everything. So we, we have, I think, I hope, a, a consensus that no one in America should starve to death. That wasn't always the case. It used to be the case that, you know, if, if you didn't have the money to buy food, and in fact, it, it still happens. But by and large, we have a, a view that, that no one should be allowed to starve to death. Um, we now have a, a sort of basic standard of health care that I think the great bulk of the American people believe we should have. Now, we, we have these thought experiments. I talk with you know, people. Suppose that we, we develop a, a, a treatment which at a cost of $150 million will let you live a healthy life until the age of 175. We probably can't. I, I would like that treatment. I would please. like that treatment too, and we obviously can't afford to do that. Now, as it turns out, there is nothing really like that. In fact, the health care that the, that the wealthiest people get is not that much better than what anybody on Medicare can get. But you know, if we, there are imaginary moral dilemmas we could have. But in fact, what we have now is the notion that there's a certain standard of health care that a country as rich as ours ought to be provided to everybody, and that's all that we mean. I agree with that, and I, I do think it appeals to sort of a, a sense of fundamental fairness, that it shouldn't depend what state you live in, whether you have access to basic health care. It shouldn't matter what your income is, what your immigration status is, what the color of your skin is, what your LGBT status is, that, that, that there's an issue of fundamental fairness. And, and what's happening right now is it really does matter what state you live in as to the quality of your health care for millions of Americans. And, and it is undeniable that, that if you are an African-American woman in the South, you're your life expectancy is actually going down in many states. And I think that just really uh, uh, defies so, so, you know, basic a sense of equity and equality and fairness in our country. You know, I, I think the logo I really want to keep in mind with healthcare is sort of uh, details, not words, which is healthcare is a right. I mean, how do you argue with that? I mean, in some sense, we all have a right to basically being healthy and not going bankrupt for healthcare, but the devil's in the details. And this is where I think we have to figure out a way to have rational conversations around what does that mean. Bernie's plan is way too generous, okay? Healthcare as a right does not mean you get everything you want for free. That's not what healthcare as a right means. If that's what it means, we can't afford it, okay? We have to have a hard conversation about what is healthcare. So the law in Massachusetts that became the version that became Obamacare, it was actually a very vague piece of legislation that said there should be a health care benefit package and not define it. So I was on a board of 10 people which had to define what is health care insurance coverage. Okay? And we decided we were the first state in the country to say that does include prescription drugs. No state had ever before said health insurance must include prescription drugs. We also said it does not include dental care. Okay? We said it does not include chiropractors. We said it does not include um, maternity coverage for dependents, actually. So dependent maternity coverage was not included. So there are a lot of, now, were those the right decisions? I absolutely do not know, okay? But are those the discussions we have to have? Absolutely. We have to be willing to sit down in society and say, what is it? And not say, oh yeah, I support great healthcare, sure, it's wonderful. No, we have to decide what that means, 
We have to sit down and say, what do we mean when we say healthcare is a right? What is a right? And I think until we're willing to face those hard decisions, then we're just going to be stuck. And I would add to that, is there a floor that we can all agree on that That's what I mean. ma maternity it, 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 care actually should be covered in all 50 states and not left up to individual states to jeopardize that sort of basic care for a totally predictable life event? What should the floor be and how much actually raise a great point? What should the floor be and how much leeway should there be among states or individuals to choose their own floor? And I think that is a great and super hard question, but we're not having the kind of political debates we need about that. So uh, we have time for one last question, and it is a question that makes me a little bit sad, um, but I'm hoping maybe you guys will help cheer me up a little bit. Um, so this question is, how can we as the public have an opinion on a particular approach to healthcare in America when the bills are usually very opaque and nobody knows exactly what is in them? And the reason this makes me sad is because what I try to do is read the bills and explain them what's in them. Um, <laughs> Um, but obviously that is not working uh, altogether. And I, <laughs> Dana, I mean, you've been talking a lot I, I, about, a about activists and about, about the public's engagement in this process. I mean, how do, uh, this stuff is complicated. You know, there, the bills, the Republican bills that were you know, recently considered were each over 100 pages long, which is substantially shorter than the Affordable Care Act. But you know, if you try to read legislation, it makes your eyes cross. Yeah, well, you had a distinct disadvantage to reporting on text of a bill that you usually got 24, maybe 36 hours before it was voted on in each chamber. So I, hats off to your ability to digest all of that. But that really is the, the flaw in, in, in the way at least the Republican leadership is approaching health care reform and and that they're not actually having any sort of transparent process and listening to the people who to your point are marching in the streets do want to be heard do want pre-existing conditions to be covered they want to move forward we want to build on what we have and not actually take a giant step forward we are making such tremendous progress across the board uh, and women's health care we are at the lowest rate of unintended pregnancies in history we are at a 30-year low in teen pregnancies uh, the lowest rate of of abortion since Roe v. Wade was decided. That's because women have access to basic contraception and care. And what's happening in this, in this debate is that those voices, those advances, those real facts are not being uh, considered. So what can the American people do? Keep doing what you're doing. Get out there. Be heard. And, and make sure that uh, you don't let the the naysayers in Washington take your, your health care away. So I just want to press a little bit harder on this question, even though it makes me feel bad about myself, because <laughs> I, I, I do think it is true that these Republican bills did not have the kind of scrutiny that you know, typically a major policy overhaul of this sort would have with the kinds of you know, public debate and hearings and, and time. But I also think you know, Obamacare has been the law for seven years now. And if you look at public opinion surveys, there are still a whole lot of Americans that don't know what that bill did and what's in it. And so I do feel like those of us who are in the communications and expertise business are, are maybe are failing the public a little bit. Well, you know, Margo, I mean, as, as you alluded to, the Affordable Care Act, the law, was 10 times longer than these Republican bills. And the regulations that were implemented as a result of the law were another 20,000 to 40,000 pages, depending on what you count. And, and so, yes, it's, and Dana spoke eloquently earlier about how regulation drives up the cost of operating Planned Parenthood. Well, that's not the only thing it drives up the cost. The regulations drive up the cost of pretty much everything. And it becomes very hard if you're an entrepreneur, if you're trying to come up with an innovative way to deliver health care uh, affordably to more people. If you have to comply with all these regulations that basically the people who are writing don't even understand the consequences of. You know, in, in the rest of the economy, we manage actually pretty well with complexity and consumerism, right? People are able to choose their cell phone provider, even though these contracts are somewhat indecipherable, because at the end of the day, if your contract for your cell phone is gonna be something that kind of fleeces you in the end, you can fire Verizon and go to AT&T or whatever you wanna do. Um, and part of that is driven by some smart regulations that helped allow for people to switch plans, but at the end of the day, there's a, it's, a, it's a very restrained view of what the government's role in telling you what to do. Whereas if you have a system where actually it's not up to Congress to write bills to determine what your health care is like. It's not up to the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service to decide what kind of health insurance you have. If it's up to you and people who are accountable to you to decide what your health care should be like, then it's a, lot it's a lot less complex of a system because those choices are in your hands instead of being taken away from you by others. Just to say, this health care is different from buying a cell phone or cell phone plan. <laughs> if you... Uh, if you, 
if you pick the wrong surgeon to do your double coronary bypass, you don't get to reject him and go for another plan afterwards. Sure, so, so, so make sure that know, there is a basic level of regulation in terms of the competence of your surgeon and the competence of the insurance plan. Make sure there are laws but, against fraud, which have always been on the books, but, but give people the choice. More than, no, but it, it, people are, by and large, just, I mean, you can, there's a very limited amount of choice. I mean, it's, it's just very different. Healthcare is, I, you can't have to explain all this. And, and, and but this anyway. is the philosophical difference that progressives and conservatives have about whether you can trust individuals to make Make these choices for themselves or not. I believe they can. Maybe you don't believe they should be entrusted not, with those not choices. On, not on this. When that's I see right. billboards advertising, that's, that's the debate we'll have go to our country. hospital because we have great coverage. I think, my God, from a billboard people are supposed to make. But the, let me say that the, uh, but on Margot's thing, the, um, look, by, by its nature, because uh, these things are, nobody can read legislation. I can't read legislation. Uh, this is where you depend upon the media to, to get it through. And on the one hand, objectively, media transmission of information is terrible. On the other hand, I've been in this business, the pundit business, for quite a while, and it's better than it ever was. Uh, I once, back, back during the 2004 election, I went, there were, there were rival healthcare plans by Bush and Kerry, and I went through transcripts of two months of TV reporting on, on healthcare. And I found that there were many discussions of how the healthcare plans were playing, but not one sentence about what was actually in them. So the, it, it actually our coverage of these issues is far better than it was. And uh, you know, right at the beginning, John said, hey, we actually had a debate just now that was settled partly on the basis of facts, and, which is something new in my experience. And CBO played a big role, but so did the media. So did the upshot. So did uh, Vox. So did you know, lots of people trying. So you know, on a scale of uh, compared with the way things ought to be, it's ghastly compared with the way things were. Actually, we're doing better. Oh, you're so optimistic tonight. This is I don't awesome. know. I must have been something I yeah. it must have been what I, I had for lunch. I, um, so let me say two things. First of all, um, Ovik's right. There is disagreement between the right and the left, the role of choice. And what economists do in this disagreement is we look at evidence. So we now have a number of studies of how people choose across health insurance plans, choose across them. And the answer is dreadfully. Okay, the typical senior choosing a Medicare Part D plan for one of their 70 options, typically, 12% of them choose the correct option, the option According that to minimizes economists. their costs, that minimizes their costs, and, um, and the typical senior leaves about 30% of the money on the table. You look at employer-provided health insurance, a quarter of, a recent study, a quarter of employer-provided health insurance people who are offered a choice of a dominated option. That's an option which is worse in every state of the world, still choose it. So choice, Unfettered choice does not work, and I come back to where I started, with something as complicated as healthcare. It's really hard, and so to come back to your question, I think the first point is we have to get away from reporters and others who claim it's easy. It's not, it's hard. I think fundamentally, <laughs> fundamentally, I think that no if you one take- No read those articles. <laughs> no, 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 but fundamentally, the number of people who have said to me, you know, oh, it's easy, just do this. It's not, it's not easy. And I think the first step is to recognize and own on both sides of the aisle that this is hard and complicated. And then we have to point people to the right reporting, the right set of facts, but we just have to recognize ultimately it's why we have a representative democracy. I mean, ultimately this is not something on which direct democracy can really function well. It's just too complicated. And people need to have a view and to be informed, but it is really, really hard. And I think the first step is to recognize that. Well, I feel like all of you are on your way to being informed because you're the kind of people that come and listen to us debate these issues uh, at great length. So um, I just want to thank our panelists. Um, I want to thank CUNY for hosting us. And, and thanks to all of you for uh, being here and listening and asking such good questions. Have a good night.